Hi, y'all. In the last video, I showed you the subroutine part of this program. I want to use it to show you a couple of things now. First of all, to see how the program looks actually running, and then to illustrate another window in the debugger. This new window is called the disassembly window. So I've already got my registers window open. Memory 1 is pointing to the N1 variable, and ESP is pointing to the stack. I'll open up a third memory window and make it illustrate where the EBP register is pointing. Now open up the disassembly window. When you check out the viewing options, there are five choices. This window is showing how the program on the left got assembled into actual code. Let's get a better view. When I check the address box, it shows me on the left-hand side the actual addresses in RAM where each one of these instructions is located in the code segment. When I check the Show Code Bytes box, it lets me see the instruction broken down into its opcodes and operands. Notice the first move ZX instruction on line 15 takes up 7 bytes, but the push EBX on line 17 only takes up 1 byte. If I check the show line numbers box, then it matches line numbers on the right to the line numbers on the left. And you can see the debugger's little yellow arrow on the right that matches where it is on the left. Now we don't really need to see the code bytes, so I'll turn that off. And then I'm going to move this part of the code up toward the top of the window. Lines 15 and 16 show where we're extending the one byte values into full size registers. Then lines 17 and 18 show those registers being pushed on the stack in reverse order. First N2, then N1. If you look on the stack in memory window 2, you'll see that happening. I press the F11 key and we enter the sub 1 procedure. So far, everything on the right has matched up to what's on the left. But now you'll get to see what some of those assembler directives will do for you. Before we go on, let's tell memory window 2 to show 4 byte integers and we'll do the same thing for memory window 3. Notice that on the stack the return address has been pushed also. Next, we save the EBP register and copy the stack pointer into the EBP register. So these three lines right here happen automatically because of the function call. Then, because we're using local variables, we have to subtract a number from the stack pointer, which moves it down from where the EBP register is pointing. Both the text and the last video told you that local variables are located below where the EBP register is pointing, and that's what's going on here. Now you might see this as an add instruction, but we're really adding a negative number because of 2's complement. The next two lines happen because of the uses directive up on line 25. By making use of this directive, we don't have to manually push those registers, nor do we have to manually pop those registers at the end of this procedure. On line 29, we reach onto the stack where value 1 is stored. Remember that in main, we push the parameters in reverse order, in 2, then in 1. So here on line 29, we're accessing where value 1 is stored on the stack. And again, value 1 is actually a copy of n1. On line 30, we copy value 1 into the local variable total 1. Remember, Total1 is the name we gave to a location below where the EBP register is pointing, because it's a local variable. But I don't have to worry about that because of that local directive. I can just use the name Total1, and the assembler will know what I'm talking about. That's a lot easier than trying to access some unnamed memory space on the stack relative to the EBP pointer. On line 31, I'm accessing the parameter that I'm calling value2 inside this procedure. 
It's really a copy of into, and I'm just going to use the EBX register to add that value to what was already in the total one local variable. If you look, you can see that the total one variable just changed. Now I'm using total one here to illustrate how easy it is to use local variables in a procedure. I don't really need to do that. In fact, because I'm going to return the total in the EAX register, I could have just used that register to store the total. But again, I want you to see how easy it is to use local variables and how they work. Just a reminder, most high-level languages return values in either the EAX, the AX, or the AL registers, depending on whether you're talking about 32, 16, or 8 bits. So that's why here I'm using the EAX. Which brings us to line 34, the return instruction. The 8 indicates that there are 8 bytes of data on the stack. And since we're using the standard call, calling convention, that means this procedure, sub 1, has to clean up the stack. The 8 bytes of data are the two parameters that we pushed on the stack before we called this procedure. The next two lines show where the ECX and the EBX registers got popped from the stack. This happened automatically, but only because we incorporated the uses directive up on line 25. If we hadn't done that, then we would have to manually push those registers and then pop them. You can read about the leave directive in section 8.4 if you want to. It was put there by the assembler to do a couple of things. It's going to let the ESP register, in other words the stack pointer, move to where it should be, and it's going to let the EBP register get its old value back where it was saved on the stack. Speaking of the EBP register, look where it's pointing. This value is what the EBP register had before we entered the procedure. And this value is the address of the next instruction that will execute after we leave this procedure. In other words, it's the return address that we're going back to in main. Because of the return instruction, we leave the procedure, and sure enough, we go back to the instruction following the procedure call. That was the address on the stack, by the way. Because total was declared as a word, I'm storing the AX register into it. Remember, the AX register is the lower half of the EAX register. Then these two lines of code appear because of line 22 to call an external function. We push the parameter of 0 and then call the function. And this number out here tells you where in RAM that function is right now. On another note, On another note, I thought I'd show you that you can use this disassembly window with high-level languages too. So I wrote a simple little C++ program that stores values in three variables, adds them up, then stores the total into another variable. I start the debugger and open the disassembly window. Now all these lines of code up here were written by the compiler and they just set up main. On line 9 is where the instructions begin that we're really interested in. If I'd asked you to write this program in assembly, you might have done something real similar to what the compiler did here. X, Y, and Z are all integers, which makes them double words. And we can see over here on the right side where I'm moving each value into its respective variable. Once I've done that, I could step through the code just as we did before. Look how many lines of assembly it takes just to send the output to the Cout object. Anyway, I thought it would be kind of neat to see how the compiler does things that we've been doing in assembly language. From this short example, it's real obvious that the compiler does a lot more things than what we've been doing. So as you write your own code, remember this disassembly window. It's a handy tool for figuring out why your program might not be working correctly. By the way, if you think you've been hearing this sound... That's Sonny the Bulldog helping me make yet another video. Which wraps this one up. Let me know if you've got any questions. And thanks for watching.